Hey everyone, welcome back to Secret Sonics. This is episode 94 with Justin Perkins. I had a great chat with Justin. We talked about so many things, including his journey from recording his band in high school to studying sound, working in recording studios, and his transition into mastering full-time. We talk about his approach to mastering, which is super unique, I think. We talk about custom scripts he has for Reaper, his super detailed approach to uh, QA using RX and stuff like that. We also got super geeky about floating point bit rates and everything else in between. So I think you're gonna love this episode. So without further ado, Further ado, here's my conversation with Justin Perkins here on Secret Sonics. You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. Join us weekly for honest conversations with real world music producers and audio professionals. And welcome back to Secret Sonics. I am your host, Ben Wallach. My guest today is Justin Perkins. Justin is a mastering engineer based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who has worked on remastering projects for The Replacements, In Vogue, Old Dirty Bastard, Busted Rhymes, and mastering projects for Michael Franti and Spearhead, Tommy Stinson, and thousands of other independent bands and artists around the world. Before transitioning to mastering full-time, he also spent time at Butch Vig Smart Studios in Madison, Wisconsin, recording and mixing a number of projects, and has been working full-time in the audio field for nearly 20 years. His studio, Mystery Room Mastering, has been in the business since 2009. Uh, Justin reached out to me after I released my conversation with Joe Costable, and we started chatting. I actually remembered his episode on Working Class Audio with Matt Boudreau, and I invited him to join me on the show, and uh, he's been gracious enough to do that. So with all that to say, welcome to Secret Sonics, Justin. Yeah, thanks for having me, and you're doing such a great job with this podcast, so it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to have you here. So so tell the audience like a little bit about you. You know, Tell us about your story. How did music begin for you, and how did that kind of transition at some point to production and audio? You know, my, my earliest memory of music is when I got into the fifth grade, you know, I, had, I already had a guitar. My dad got me a little guitar, and I was halfway interested in it. And, and he was really big into music, but he was also a truck driver, so he was gone a lot. So when I was younger, it was like I would do sports a lot, and then when my dad was around, music was fun to do. But really, when I hit the fifth grade, I had this teacher who every Friday, he would bring his guitar into the classroom. And Friday afternoon, we would end the week with him playing his guitar, and the whole class would sing Beatles songs. And I was already a fan of the Beatles, you know, from my dad and family. And um, it was just a fun way to end the week. It was really cool to see somebody, you know, playing a real guitar, playing real songs right in front of me, you know, a couple feet away. That was not something I had really seen before. And he was really good at it and really good at getting the class into it. And so that guitar I had sitting around, I was a little more inspired to pick it up and learn songs. And right around the same time, um, Nevermind by Nirvana had just come out. And I had some friends where we were experimenting with trying to play music, and obviously it was really bad, but you got to start somewhere. And But when Nevermind by Nirvana came out, that was just so different sounding than anything I had heard. You know, growing up in the Midwest before the internet, you know, I didn't have access to a wide range of music, especially as a fifth grader. But, you know, that was when that became popular, it just stood out to me because, you know, prior to that, it was MC Hammer, Vanilla Ice and stuff that was really overproduced, like 80s stuff. And I love a lot of that stuff, but it was so unattainable, like to make those sounds as a some a fifth grade kid without a computer or anything other than a guitar. I'm like, I don't know how people make this music. And then when Nirvana came out, I'm like, oh, that's just a guitar, a drum set, a bass and a singer. Like, I think we could do that. So between, you know, my teacher inspiring me, my dad already giving me a guitar, and and my mom, my, both my parents got me a, a guitar, and um, between that and then seeing a new band like Nirvana just totally doing awesome stuff, that kind of inspired us to start our own bands uh, at a pretty young age. Wow, yeah, fifth grade is really young. Yeah. I think I started uh, the bass in, like, eighth grade, you know? Yeah, it, it was kind of young, and I had a friend that was, like, also interested in the same music and learning guitar. I, I taught him how to play guitar, too, you know, what I knew, which wasn't much. And then he actually ended up becoming better at guitar, so I switched over to bass just because it was just easier than trying to find a bass player. You know, there was not many <laughs> people to choose from, so I'm like, I'll play bass. We had a couple people that said they had drums or 
could play drums. But it wasn't until a few years later that like this guy that was babysitting us after school, I wouldn't call it babysitting. It was more like watching us after school until our parents got home. He's a little older and we convinced him to get a drum set. It's kind of like, if you're already going to be here... <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you get a drum set? Because then we can make some noise, you know, before it's dinner time, and we got to be quiet. So, um, so you drafted up your babysitter to join your band? <laughs> pretty much. I mean, I think he had played trumpet at the time, but anyways, so he became our drummer for a long time. And uh, I'll try to speed up here, but you know, that turned into like some other middle school bands. You know, different variations of pretty much the same thing. Maybe like a different drummer or a different bass player, you know, swapping around, but things like that. So I got into it at a pretty early age. And, you know, this is before I would say the home recording revolution took off. Um, obviously, people were recording at home, but it was more involved to have a recording setup, I feel like, at that time. Like, it was more expensive and everything was bigger. You didn't just go to Best Buy and get a laptop and you have a recording studio. So we had tried to record at the studio in our town and we, we dropped them off like a boombox demo tape and never heard back. You know, they probably had better bands to record at the time. And then kind of around the same time, we I noticed an ad advertisement at the music store, at the instrument music store. And it was a guy that was he had an eight track, you know, a cassette eight track that you could rent. And I had never touched one before, but we called him and uh, he dropped it off and explained how it worked. And again, I, I'm not really like tech savvy or electronics person, but uh, I guess I paid the most attention when he dropped it off. And I was probably the most driven to make it work because, you know, we were doing these bands and we wanted to get a recording that sounded halfway decent. So I was kind of the one that took the lead on like, how does this thing work? And uh, yeah. so then like friends of ours who had bands started hearing these recordings and they say, Hey, can you record us? And I'd say, I, I mean, I guess so. I got to call, <laughs> I got to call the guy and rent the thing. And then we got to find a place to do it. You know, sometimes they would come to like my dad's basement. Sometimes I would go to their basement. It just kind of depend on the situation, but kind of grew from there. And then by the time we were good enough to play like legitimate shows, that just really opened things up as far as other bands asking me to record them. Then it, then it wasn't just other band like the two other bands at our high school. It was like bands from other cities, other music scenes, and it just kind of grew from there. As wow. I was still in high school, I mean, I did as much as you could as a high school student that you know still had to go to school, still had, <laughs> still probably ha I had a part time job like. I don't know, dish washing dishes and stuff like that. But I was slowly developing my skills, even though I didn't realize it. I didn't know that it could be a career. It was just something fun to do. That's wild. You basically had a business already in high school. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, like I said, I still washed dishes and uh, did some other things. And um, but it was enough to like figure out if it was something I was interested in and something that other people would want me to do. And, you know, they did. So I just kind of took it from there. I knew that I wasn't college material, so kind of compromised with my parents and went to the recording workshop, which I think you said you're from Ohio. Are you from Ohio or you lived in Ohio? Oh, my dad, my dad's from Ohio. Okay. I'm from New York, actually. Gotcha. Yeah. So in the middle of nowhere, Ohio, is this recording workshop. And, you know, I found it in the back of Rolling Stone magazine or something. Because, again, this is probably the year 2000 or 99. And the internet just wasn't what it is today, of course. So I yeah. went to the recording workshop. I actually skipped the pro, you know, there was like a two-week thing where you could learn pro tools. Overall, it was like six months, maybe. And that's why it was attractive to me is I didn't want to do any college. I'm like, I'm done with math, science, all the traditional stuff. I had, I had enough of that. I'm like, I just want to learn music. You know, I just want to do music. So anyways, I went to this recording workshop, skipped the Pro Tools thing because it was still kind of new at the time. And I wasn't really very computer savvy at the time. So I just went there and learned like signal flow and microphones and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And uh you know, they really, like most schools, they really sell themselves. Like once you get out of the school, there's going to be so many jobs waiting for you. And there really wasn't. Huh. You know, when the, when the program yeah. was over, like suddenly they weren't as in touch with you anymore. Uh, and I'm not trying to diss the school. Like it was a good school and they taught legitimate stuff. You know, I'm, I'm happy that I went. But I think, and that was sort of like on the edge of... You know, towards the end of the time when there was like the traditional studio setup where there was like interns, assistants, like staff, you know, like it was about to change drastically the music industry where like studios were really downsizing. Um, yeah, this is like a second before Napster, right? Yep, right around that same time. So, anyways, I didn't find a job anywhere. 
and part of it was my fault. I didn't really have any ambition to move to New York or L.A. or Nashville. So, you know, as far as studio jobs in Wisconsin, you know, not, not that many studios. But I did end up moving to a studio in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Just, again, kind of out of luck. It was a great studio. And you like when, when I would listen to bands local band's albums, you could tell within like three seconds if they went to the good studio and recorded it because it just <laughs> sounded awesome right away. You're like, oh, yeah, they went to the good studio. It was called Simple Studios. And, uh, you know, especially in the punk rock, in the rock scene, like it was known to be the best studio for sure in, in the, this part of the state. So, you know, at some point we recorded there, but I didn't engineer any of it. We just went in and he did his thing. Um, and I wanted to stay out of the I didn't want to be the annoying person that's like telling the studio guy how to do his job. So I just kind of sat back. But then he moved from his basement studio to like a nice big space. And he invited our band back because we had gotten a somewhat of a record deal with, with Lookout Records, which is, if, if you know the band Green Day, that's where Green Day got their start on mm -hmm. Lookout Records, their first two. Cool. So it was kind of a big deal for us. And we had more of a budget than we'd ever imagined we'd ever have. So anyways, he uh, invited us to his new studio to give it a test drive. It wasn't really like fully set up, but he, he needed a bit of a guinea pig. And anyways, I brought some recording gear and it was such a long day that, you know, at the end of the session, we'd like loaded up our van with our instruments, but I forgot to pack up the recording gear that I brought with to help, you know, with the session. And he called the next day, but I wasn't home. This is before cell phones. You know, he talked to my dad, I think, and he said, you know, Justin forgot some stuff, just letting you know. And then my dad was like, well, why doesn't he just bring all this stuff up there, you know? And a light bulb, <laughs> I, I think a light bulb went off with the studio guy just because he um, he still had a full-time job at like a factory or a mill. So there was like big chunks of time where he couldn't use his studio. Like there'd be like four days where he'd be like doing 12-hour shifts and just the studio wow. was empty. So it kind of just worked out naturally where he's like, yeah, okay. So I brought all my stuff up there and... It's hard to say if I got hired or if I was freelancing there. It was somewhere in between. Like mm. I was doing my own projects there, but he was also feeding me projects um, of people that would call him and he didn't have time to do. So I kind of learned the ins and outs of recording bands there like a lot faster because it was just set up better for recording than my basement ever could have been. Yeah, so cool. So you're playing, ba you're playing bass in this band and you're recording at the same time. This is all happening together. Yeah, I mean, we were still doing we were doing a lot of shows, and then when I wasn't doing shows, I would record bands. It was it was easier to manage back then. Sometimes I wonder how anything got done before the internet. Like I don't have really any recollection of having like a, a scheduling system or yeah. a calendar or anything. I just I don't know. Somehow there were less distractions though. <laughs> yeah, but somehow it all was happening and was getting done. You know, playing shows. We never did any huge long tours, but we would do regional stuff. Uh, a couple U.S. tours, and yeah, just recording bands when I wasn't doing shows, and that was a great balance. And at some point, I was able to quit my part-time job. Like, my last part-time job, I think I was bartending at, like, a pizza place that had live music. So it was kind of a good place to be as far as meeting people, but, you know, clients and stuff. But I was a terrible bartender, and yeah. at some point, it was just getting in the way. You know, I, I would work there on, like, Mondays and Tuesdays, and then re do recording and shows later in the week. And then I just got so busy that like I needed those Mondays and Tuesdays to do mixing or editing or, you know, there was stuff to do eventually where I'm like, I just got a, this job is getting in the way. The part-time job is getting in the way. Yeah. So I have to quit. You just grinded it out until until you had enough work with the audio to just, yeah. just go, go all in. And it was a little bit scary. Even though I was making like probably close to minimum wage and not even full-time, it was... A little scary to quit that and do music full time. You know, and like prior to that, the area I grew up in was just so rich with pretty decent paying, semi skilled labor jobs. So, like somewhere in the middle there of having a, a real job, you know, I could work at a, a factory, like driving a forklift, like make pretty good money, and then just quit without having any fear of finding like a similar job, like when, when I needed it. You know, it was just a different economy. Yeah. And I actually read some someone randomly sent me a story about how, especially back in that era, like the, where I lived, it was one of the best places in the country for finding like a job like that with no college education, um, but enough to earn a decent wage and even support a family if you need to. So wow. I was really lucky to just live in this area. I mean, it's a lot of paper mills and industrial stuff. And I actually really enjoyed driving the forklift, like third shift, because um, there's not a lot of people in the... <laughs> in the building but um so stuff like that but eventually i just had to 
jump into music full time because uh, there was enough work to do. That's awesome. So, so what and you know what led you down the road into mastering? Because I feel like that's like super niched in. Yeah, it is. Well, at that time, you know, this is like early to mid two thousands. Again, the internet is not what it, it wasn't what it is today, and we're kind of isolated looking back up there in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Like 